Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm not sure if you're as excited as I, as I am about the spring and about seeing people face to face. This is so exciting to me. It's like, wow, I forgot how cool this is. So welcome. Thank you for coming. And my name is Diane Monreal. I'm a Lake County Master Gardener. And I'm going to do a presentation today for adding plants to your landscape affordably. Making a beautiful landscape in your vegetable garden, in borders, or in your beds. What I want to do is talk about how to get those plants there without having to go to the store and spend a million dollars and worry about some of them not making it. There are different ways of doing it. Some are practical, simple, and some are impractical and a lot more involved. You can see we're going to go through each of these uh, in more detail. So the pros of ha getting plants, they're quick. It's easy. You go to the store and you say, I like that one. The cons are that they it can be very expensive, especially if you want to put in more than one thing. And you're limited to the choices of whatever the store has. Like maybe you, for example, um, there is a hydrangea that I wanted. Um, it, it doesn't have those big full blooms. It's called lacy. And they are fantastic for pollinators. And I have looked in every store that I could think of. I've looked online, even at the places where they say we have unusual, hard to find, and I can't find them. If I found three stores, they're all sold out. And that was in January. So sometimes when you want to plant, you're going to have, uh, have to deal with only getting what they have available. But if you do choose to get a plant, it's pretty simple. You bring it home, you find a home for it, and you dig your spot or fill your pot, and you have your plant. If you want to go to uh, the other side, where you can get lots of choices, you want to look at seeds. And there are a variety of pros for that. Number one is that you have a variety. You can go to any store and get a variety, you know, four sides. You're walking around looking for all the different seeds. But if you get a catalog, then you have to sit down with a cup of tea, put your feet up, a marker, you know, because there's lots and lots of choices. I have a catalog at home that is only for tomatoes. A whole catalog just for tomatoes. That's crazy, but it's true. So you have a lot of variety. Seeds can be a very economical choice, except the spoiler alert is that if you lack self-control or if you have uh, an imagination bigger than your property, you will end up buying more seeds than you know what to do with. And then it becomes not economical anymore. Uh, it's a great winter hobby, something that we can sink our fingers into while we're waiting for the soil to warm up. And there is, according to my friend, sir, uh, a sense of personal satisfaction that comes from growing plants that you grew yourself from seeds. The cons, in my opinion, are just that it takes time for the seeds to grow. Um, on the positive side of the con is you have time in the winter, in the early spring, to get those seeds going. If you're using seeds, um, you get them two different ways, usually. You get them either from a store or a catalog, or you get them from someone, including yourself, who has maybe self-harvested. and. It's very important if you want success with seeds to pay attention to how the seed, what the seed needs in order to grow. On the back of the packet, if you have a packet, there will be lots of information that will help you um, be successful. To, it doesn't look like a lot, but there's so much information in there that that's another sit down with a cup of tea and really look through that. And you want to do that before planting day. I just bought a packet of plants or seeds. This is a little embarrassing, being that I'm a master gardener. And I thought, OK, and I'm lining up the dates that everything needs to get planted. And I'm all pumped up about this one kind of flower. And it said, you don't get any flowers the first year. And I'm like, wait a minute. 
<laughs> That's not what I bargained for, right? So pay attention to the back of the packet. If you're um, getting a seed from someone who has shared and self-harvested, or yourself, when you gather those seeds, you want to write down as much stuff as you can on that envelope, like fill it. How big does the plant grow? Does it need a lot of sun? Does it need a little bit of water? How does, it, how does the seed germinate? Does it need to be stratified or scarified? Those are some interesting words that you might see on the back. Scarifying, I always think of a scar, right? So the seed is hard and it's not gonna sprout without some help. So maybe you'll soften it in water. It'll tell you that on the seed packet. Maybe it, you'll need to scratch it, kind of like giving it a scar, okay, before you plant it. S stratifying is the other one. <laughs> I always get the two confused except scarring, you scar it. Stratifying, it needs to get cold. And you need to read the package because sometimes it needs to be cold for months. And sometimes it needs to be cold for a week. Sometimes it needs to be cold in soil. So you have to read the packet. And if you're getting seeds from somebody else, or if you save them, and you don't know for sure how to get it to be, to be a grown up, if you can get the name of it, the real name of it, that's gonna help because you can look that up and you can type it in the computer and ask how to germinate such and such a seed. And it will have those details that you're missing on that envelope. So when you grow the seed, some seeds, you know Cleveland, Ohio in our cold, long winters, some seeds won't get grown up until after the growing season. Like if you plant peppers in your garden, you're never gonna get a pepper before it starts snowing again. So you need to give those seeds a head start and you need to grow, start them earlier. There's a couple of ways of doing that. One is up at the top, that's a picture of someone who's doing some winter sowing. And you can see that snow, and those jugs are outside. And a benefit to winter sowing is that after you get the seeds in there, it's hands off for you for a long time. They grow as that soil warms, and as that plant, as that seed gets what it needs, it will sprout and grow. It doesn't grow too early. Um, there's a protection with that container over the top of it, or actually it's a hatch, and so it's the, pack, the bottom of the uh, jug is still there. It's protected from frost, but it also doesn't need, you don't need to harden it off. If you're planting like this, you're gonna need to harden those off before you bring them outside because they're used to the warm environment inside, and if you, they'll get shocked if you bring them outside right away. So that's an advantage to winter sowing. They get a slow start. People go out there all the time checking to see if like they killed them all or if it's not going to happen, but it happens. It just is a slower start. In my experience, it, I did some experiments with same kinds of seeds inside and outside to see which ones produced more, which ones were hardier. The winter sowing ones always look like they were not going to do as well, and by the end of the summer they were when you're weighing what you're getting, they were doing the exact same thing. So um, I became a big fan of winter sowing. Um, this is when, if you're gonna be indoors, you're gonna want a place where it's sunny and where it's warm. And your seed packet's gonna tell you if the seed needs to light to germinate. Most, most of them don't, but sometimes some seeds need to stay right up on top and sometimes the seed needs to go in and it'll tell you. Seed goes into a depth of a half an inch or whatever. So you'll look for that on your seed packet. And then there are other seeds that you can plant in your, in your yard or in your garden just directly into the soil when it warms and there's a, no more danger of frost. Now we'll talk about cuttings. Um, the pros to cuttings are that it's economical because you probably have access to the plant, either a friend or your own self, and you want just more of that kind. And you'll have other, the variety that you're looking for from the plants that you have. Cons would be, again, time. It takes time for the roots to sprout. I put these other two down here just relating to my own heart. Ignorance, you're not gonna do cuttings if you don't know about it. And you're not gonna do cuttings if you're afraid. 
I don't know what to do. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work, blah, blah, blah. It's not a big deal. It's not expensive. So I would encourage you to be brave. Give it a try. So this is uh, two examples of cuttings, or, or three actually. So you can see that first one is a flower pot with a geranium, and they just notice where they made that cut. You don't want any flowers on the stem that you're using to make uh, a cutting. Any kind of you know wilted leaf or whatever, pull that bugger off. And then you can um, do put cuttings in a so uh, soilless mixture, right, with vermiculite and perlite or you can put it into water. The first time I heard about cuttings, I didn't know what they were, but my neighbor from a gazillion years ago when I was like about six, showed me how to do a cutting from a pussy willow tree. And um, she said, just put, go home and put this in two inches of water, and it worked. And I had this, by the time I left my mom and dad's house, the tree was enormous. It was enormous from you know, just go home and stick it in the water. Be, you have to be patient. Um, so anyways, this one is of a stem. You notice there's a, some leaves on it, that's important. Down here it's a plant, um, just the leaf. And the little stem that comes out of the bottom is called a petiole, you want that. And that's where the roots come from. They put that right in water. The one above was in the um, soilless mix. And th these are just stem cuttings, but it's a woody. And it still works. Last year, I, my daughter gave me a, a new task in the garden. Um, she learned about something and she wanted to know if it was true. So I was going to do this experiment. And I needed sticks for markers. And so I just went into the little wooded area and got a bunch of broken branches. And I stuck them in the ground just where I needed them. Little skinny guys. And I don't know, about July. I'm in the garden working and all of a sudden I noticed that they were sprouting. I thought they were dead. There was no fancy cutting, nothing. I snapped them like this and shoved them in the ground and it still took. Mm -hmm. Cuttings are not anything to be afraid about. Give it a try. I mean, the worst that can happen is it doesn't grow and it costs you five minutes. So give it a try. Layering is another option. The pros are that sometimes when other methods are not successful for you, layering can work. It's not hard. It's economical because you'll probably have the plant already that you're going to be trying to get more plants of. Maybe you want to make a border instead of just have one. A lot of people who like plants tend to buy one of something and another one and another one, right, instead of having a grouping. And this is a nice way of getting a grouping. And the new plant that you get from layering is going to be just like the parent plant. Okay, this will happen with cuttings as well. It is going to be exactly the same kind. It's not going to have a different color flower. Or the, the leaves are going to be a different shape. It's going to be exactly the same. The cons for this are like many of the other ones. There's, it's going to take time for the roots to develop. And you'll get a smaller number of plants you saw all these. There's a whole bunch there, right? But with layering, you're working with one plant to layer it. So you can only get as many plants from that one plant as you can layer. So here's some different ways of layering. The first one is just a simple layer because it's just one. So you're taking a, a this is the time to do it in the spring, early, early spring, right? So the plant is supple. You're going to take that branch and you Push, the, push it down into the soil, and there's a stake there. I think you can probably see it. But if you don't have stakes, you can use a rock, a heavier rock, just to hold it down. And then you're going to want to make sure there's soil over the top of it. Over time, roots will grow. We'll, we'll move on, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The next one is called mounding. And that's where you take soil and build it up around the like a little trunk or a stem there and the soil is going to encourage more growth to come out of there and when it's time for the new plant to be moved you'll cut part of the stem and make sure it has roots to go with it all right and then you'll take that and put that into its new spot with the single single layering i'm going to come over here you're going to cut like right here or right here. 
and this will have root grown roots, and then you'll take that and move that to where you want it to go. The compound layering is down all the way at the bottom, and you've taken one branch, obviously it's a long branch, and your serpentine, right, it's going down and in, and you attach it, come up, go down again and attach it, either with a stake or with the rock, and go up as many times as you can, however long that is and however flexible your branch is. And you want to make sure that your soil covers it up. And you can see, that's a great picture of showing you how the roots will grow from what was down in the ground. And then when you want to move those, after you're sure there's a good root system down there, you know, you just don't want one little tiny white root, give it a time to get a, a good root system. You will cut those there, 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 and then you'll probably trim that up and move those to wherever you want them in your yard. The last one is quite simple, right? You, you take your branch, cut your end off, put it in the ground, and you want to try to if it goes down by itself, that's great. You don't have to attach it. But you might need to attach it, make it stay down there, right? And then over time, those roots will grow. You can cut this off, and this, your new plant will come up right here. All right. Some of you, if you've grown tomato plants, you may have seen this accidentally happen, where your tomato plant tips over or one of the branches is reaching to the ground and all of a sudden you notice there's new roots growing out of there, that's layering. It's like accidental layering sometimes. I'm just gonna give you a little, this, the mound, mound one, so roots up by the stem is a little bit dangerous for a plant because those roots, if they, if they wrap around this, they can kill that. Okay, so go back to that fear thing I won't do this at my yard. You all can do it if you want, you want to try. But that scares me a little bit because the th plants in my yard I like, and so if I'm going to do something that might endanger one, I'd rather try a different way to, to do that. I don't want to scare you, but I just wanted to point that out. The next one are divisions. Many of you people know about divisions already, right? Oh my gosh, I have so many daylilies. Do you want some? Want some? Um, so they're, they're easy to come by a lot of times. The new plant, when you do a division, is going to be just like the parent plant. And when you do divisions, it helps invigorate that parent plant. A lot of times, you'll notice that you need to make a division because you're not, you got a lot of green, but you're not getting as many flowers. It's too big. It's, there's too much. So you're going to break it apart and hopefully somebody else will want them. Cons are that the division is a seasonal thing. You can do it if it flowers in the, let me see if I can get this right. If it flowers in the spring, you divide it in the fall. And if it flowers in the fall, you divide it in the spring. Okay, so you have to kind of pay attention and know when your plant's supposed to be flowering, even if it's not. So these are some great examples of people dividing plants by gently pulling away the roots from each other. They made me laugh because this is what happens in my yard. We use spades, we use saws, we use forks, and we're not gentle at all, <laughs> okay? Because they're big, heavy um, clumps of root systems. But if you have sandy soil, this may be the way you're going to be doing it. You dig your plant up and you gently pull apart the roots. You want to make sure that there are roots and the stems and leaves to both sides. You can see that pretty well in those pictures. I got to tell you, this is the way I do it because I have not happy that loose clay, I mean not loose soil. Um, and they divide just as well. The next one we can talk about are bulbs and corms. The pros are that they're readily available. You've got daffodils in your yard or tulips in your yard or crocuses in your yard. Um, you, you'll be having little babies and you're going to break those off. And I'll show you in the next picture more realistically. 
So you have a daffodil, a tulip, and a crocus. And in the bottom picture, you, you just break those side ones off. And you'll plant, I plant them right away after, when I'm break, dividing and breaking them off. And the corms are over here on the side by me. Tubers, stolons, and rhizomes. So the, con, the pros are that it's economical. And again, the cons are that it's time. But these are pretty fast-growing things. I don't feel like you suffer too much for, um, in the patient's department, or need to, because they grow fairly quickly. The tubers are, an example are potatoes. You're, you just dig out, dig under, and you break them off. And if you grow potatoes, you know that you can, if you had a long growing season, you could take those and just replant them and grow again. We don't live in an area where you could do that. We usually dig them up and eat them. But if you had a, if you had a forever growing season, you could dig up some of those potato plants, some of those potatoes, replant them, and they'll grow again. That's the idea of a tuber, okay? Stolons are plants like the strawberry, and the bottom picture shows it a little bit more clearly, but the top one's more realistic. You've got your main strawberry plant, and then this runner comes out on the top, and it's just growing along and growing along, and it will grow another strawberry plant, and that strawberry plant right there will re-root, okay? And you can see them on top. That's what makes a stolen a stolen, is that the roots are up on top of the ground. They're out of the ground. And another mm, not so favorite is the ground ivy, which does that beautifully as well. If, you, you know, if you're not growing strawberries, you can definitely see it with the ground ivy. It just reroots, so you'll, you'll pull up a whole bunch of it, right, and then you're stuck. You're up here, but you're stuck in all the different directions because it has rerooted all around that. Those are stolons. Rhizomes are similar to stolons, but, so they grow out horizontally, but they grow just at the soil level or a little bit under the soil level. So you're not going to see that runner, okay? So this is an example of um, an iris and a uh, turmeric. Ginger does the same thing. And if you're going to divide those, we didn't talk about dividing the stolons, but you can almost in guess where you would just cut it, take that, and move it, right? Pretty simple. The, the rhizomes are a little bit um, less obvious. There's a good picture here of the angle cut. See that? So you have a part of the root and the stem, part of the root and the stem. And here as well, they're showing you right up here where they're cutting. And it's not any magical spot in there, right? It's just making sure that both sides have what they need to live. Grafting and tissue cultures are two options for increasing the plants in your yard, but they are not very practical. The G and the TC on the pros are grafting or tissue culture. Um, the pros are that the grafting can produce more vigorous varieties. An example of that are fruit trees. A lot of times you'll have an apple tree that has a root system from one tree and a trunk from a different tree. So they like the kind of apples that this tree grows, but it's not hardy. So they graft the, a hardy root um, tree to get tree with a top of the plant of what you're really wanting. It makes it a hardier plant. It's a little tricky to do. You have to cut it exactly so it fits perfectly together. It's not something the average home gardener tries, but if you want to, go ahead. They also do buds where they'll just um, graft a bud onto the other uh, stem so that it, it does the same sort of thing, but it's not the whole entire tree trunk to a root. It's just the bud to the stem. That's kind of a cool idea to try. It's less risky for me. Um, tissue cultures, an advantage is that you get identical plants produced and you get them quickly, a lot of them quickly. The cons are that 
both of these are, are precise work. Uh, the tissue cultures happening in a lab, very controlled environment, and grafting the a con is that there's risk a risk factor in rejection, right? You're putting two things together that didn't grow up together. It's like a um, transplant, right? There's a risk of a, um, rejection. So in review, there's different ways to get more plants in your yard. Um, plant just by buying plants getting seeds, cuttings, layerings, divisions, bulbs, corms, tubers, and rhizomes, or stolons, and then the much more uh, difficult ones, grafting and tissue cultures. Questions? Yes? Um, when you talk about the winter sowing, yes. what kind of things are you, sa you said you like to do that. What kind of things can you winter sow and when do you do that? Um, I winter sow all, lots of my vegetables from the garden. I don't winter sow things like green beans because I don't need to, right? They're going to grow. Like, what do I do with them when they come up? I can't do anything until later. Anyways, those go right into the garden. Um, so I, I pretty much do anything that needs a long growing period. Peppers would be in there. Um, I'm trying to think of something I don't put in there. If it's warm, if it grows in the warmth, I just wait and put those right in my garden. If it needs a longer growing period, I put in, do winter so sowing. Do peppers that way? Yeah. And um, flowers, marigolds, um, basil, my herbs, they all go in there. No wheat? Why not? I never tried it, but I would think you could sure try it. It's kind of a tough one to start from seeds. So. Well, on the picture you had a milkweed, it said milkweed on one. Right. Yeah, so somebody was doing it. Let's go, let me see if I can go back to that. Okay, so when I first started winter sowing, I was so excited, right? Hello, there you are. I was so excited about it. Um, I'm out there in January because the woman who taught me about it said, oh, yeah, you could do it. That's why people like it, right? You can get into it in the winter. And I'm doing it in the winter. Well, come on, these little buggers aren't going to grow in the winter. It's too cold, right? They can survive right but they're not going to grow so this year i i'm ready but i haven't started yet i'm ready um i'm going to wait till st patrick's day um and we're going to try it that way um i've done it in february before uh, you want to make sure your seeds are viable you know um, a lot of times we save seeds and we say look i didn't use these i'll use them again and again and again and then you're thinking oh winter sowing doesn't work because these seeds didn't sprout, but maybe you saved them for too long. Um, so you know how to, raise your hand if you know how to check to see if your seeds are viable, if they're alive. Okay, so here's what you do. You take a paper towel, you get it wet, you put 10 seeds on it, 10's a great number, and I'll tell you why in a second. 10 seeds on it, you make sure they're touching the wet, and then you put it in a warm place, maybe on your refrigerator. People have refrigerators that get warm anymore. <laughs> um, uh, sunny location and you wait and when the seed starts to sprout you count them and if seven sprouted your seeds are worth it okay if you only got two out of the ten you might as well go buy another pack because it's it's not there's not enough viability in the packet of seeds that you have okay and you can do that with any seeds you want, although some of the seed packets, we were talking about affordability, seed packet, right? Three forty-nine, you get five seeds in there. Eh, that kind of wrecks the whole thing about testing, right? So, um, but if you have a lot, like carrots or lettuce, and you want to see if those things are still viable, that's how you would test it. Okay. Yes. In that picture you have up there in the upper left, the uh, gallon jug. Did you say those were hinged? You, so you, um, I actually hmm. have some. look at I'm you, sure yeah. cool, you're going to, three inches from the bottom, you take a blade and you cut almost all the way around, leaving the handle side attached, so it's going to open and close like that, right? You fill the bottom with soil, oh look it, perfect. All right, so you're going to put your soil in here. You want to put like 
three inches or so. Um, seed starting soil. The bottom should have holes in it for drainage. So I just take a, a really big drill before I cut it, makes it easier for me, and I drill in several holes. Fill your soil um, or your seed starting medium, and it should be wet but not soggy. Okay, so I usually mix all mine in a big uh, five gallon pail and spoon it in. Then you put your seeds in. I am pretty anal about this because I want to know how many are sprouting because I have a plan for where I want these. So I actually put them in like little cute rows. Sometimes if they have the same sprout time and the same requirements, I might put a divider in here and sow two different kind of seeds. Like I don't want a million tomato plants because it's really hard for me to say you die because I don't have room for you, right? So I'll divide this, close it up. You tape this shut because the wind can um, blow it open. Now I have a whole bunch of old milk crates, so I put mine in the milk crates so they can't blow open. But if you are just like laying them out, you're going to want to um, make it stay shut. Take this lid off because this is what lets some water go in and you can get rid of the lid. You're going to, um, that will let some of the water in, but you don't get a ton of water in there. And if you get a ton, it's draining through the bottom anyways. A word of caution, these are not heavy and we get some strong winds, which is why I use the milk crate. Um, they'll blow all over your backyard and then for sure sowing, um, winter sowing is not going to work for you, okay? So you want to do something to secure these. Um, you can tie a bunch of them together. If you have a tree, you could like tie them around the tree, right? Do you understand the thought of that? So that they're not blowing away, they're not tipping over because they really do need to stay still. And then I, you put them in a very sunny location or south facing? I put them in a sunny location. I only have like two sunny locations in my yard, so they go in the sunny location. Um, yes, and then, then you just leave them be. You know, you can go out there and peek at them, but you don't need to disturb them. You don't need to mix up the soil. If you planted them the way that um, Packet said to plant them, you don't need to mess with them after that, okay? And then when it comes transplant time, these are probably, most of these will be things that need um, no frost. Then after our frost date, the last frost date, you can put them out, plant them in your garden. If it gets, um, you know how we have some days that are like super hot, like today's gonna be 61, right? But when they get, if it's too hot, you, you lift this off, flip, flip it open, because this is a greenhouse effect, then you don't wanna cook those little things in there either. You know what I mean? So you're gonna wanna give them some, um, a cooler temperature inside. It's as if you were making, had a, a cold frame and they, they lift the lid to let some ventilation and the heat out. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? You said you were going to plant on St. Patrick's Day. How late um, do you recommend? So your seed packet will say, okay, this, if you're going to do, um, you're going to start early, it'll say it needs six to eight weeks. Okay. okay so. I always feel like our weather's so weird, um, so inconsistent, that I add a week on to that. I go a week earlier. So some things that I, I could plant, um, well, uh, also, um, there are things that could get planted outside for real on September 17th. So, and I might plant those in here too, um, and transplant. I, I'll, I do a lot of experimenting in my yard to see what is working better. So I would, like let's say peas, which you don't usually transplant. Um, I've been reading some interesting things about uh, transplanting things that you usually wouldn't plant. Um, beets, for example. You're not supposed to transplant root vegetables because the root um, is not to be disturbed. Um, I've been transplanting beets for the past three years and getting great beets, like bigger beets than I ever had before. I, when you transplant them, you need to poke a deep hole in and try to help the root fall into that hole. 
as opposed to just smushing it on top, right? But so I would do peas. I would have some in here, and I'd have some in my garden, and I'd see what, what's, what's happening, what's doing better. I love winter sowing. Um, even if you just do a couple gallon things, it's, and you don't have to do a milk jug, right? I mean, they have those orange juice containers that are clear. You want it to be, you want to, sun to get in there. You don't want to use a yellow one or some dark colored one because you want the real sun to get in there. Yep. Tomatoes would be perfect for that. Yes. Tomatoes are good. Broccoli is great in Broccoli here. Broccoli mm -hmm. peppers. And so if, if you cut this too high, then you've um, removed that window of space that allows that vegetable to get taller, right? So this is cut um, a little bit high, but you don't fill the dirt, the soil, all the way up there, right? The soil's lower so that there's that growth space. Make sense? Okay. Is that anybody else? I thought it, yep. Um, bulbs, um, like daffodils. Yes. Like He, like this yeah, uh, I don't know the real master gardener answer to that. Does anybody, all my master gardener friends? I, I do it after they flower, right? So, so the flowers are spent, right? And I'm work. You can see where they are. Right. right. You don't want to go. <laughs> I trashed my whole yard looking for my three daffodils. No. So, so it, you know where they are. The greens are there. They're starting to fall over. You dig that up, see where the baby, um, I'm sure they're not really called babies, but you um, take the little um, bulbs off the sides and then put those where you want them to be. Yeah? I was just going to say, you mentioned um, all the experiments that you're doing. Yes. Um, how do you um, record those so you know what kind of worked and what didn't work? Yeah. Or you in some kind of paper journal? I have a paper journal. Okay. I have a paper journal. I probably would be a grown-up thing for me to use a computer, but <laughs> I use paper journal. I can walk around with my journal. Other people do their phones, right? But I'm all muddy. I don't really wear gloves all the time. So then I'm doing this, trying to, you know, I use a paper journal. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, this is kind of specific to a certain plant, the sweet potato vine. Yes. And I always plant it in the window boxes, and I have quite a few, so it's so expensive. And I always get the sweet potatoes. Is there any way I could do anything with them over the winter and reuse them, or is it done mm. for? So, oh, you can divide. You can use those slips. You can make slips yourself. Mm -hmm. um, are you eating them no, or just pretty ornamental? Pretty yeah, ornamental. Sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is not scientific. This is another experiment. You could save one, mm -hmm. you, uh, like even the, the little potato. Right. You know how to put it in the water? Yeah. Like you, you, um, they put uh, toothpicks, right, and it'll sprout, okay, and then plant that. I don't know how long it would take, right. but it might make it. So you have to plant that when it's real warm. That's the thing. And I wonder, does anybody know this? Can you refrigerate them? Probably not, because they need warm weather. It would probably rot. Um, I would try to, to sprout it and see if you see, oh, this could be like an ongoing winter. See, I get all excited about these experiments. It could be an ongoing winter thing where you have sprouted it, right? and you plant it in your house and see, I would probably use like a five gallon pail, something that it could really grow, and then see if you can, maybe it would take two generations to get you to the next planting season outside. I don't know how long they, it takes them to grow. The color, yeah, the green and the burgundy and stuff, yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, it's an experiment, not a definite answer, yes. Ornamental, this is probably off the subject, but ornamental sweet potatoes. Yep. When you pull them up, mm -hmm. there's those little potatoes. Are they edible? I don't know. <laughs> don't try it. Don't try it. No, that's not a good idea. Re there are certain things you can experiment with and certain things you shouldn't, right? Ingestion is something you don't want to experiment with. Um, I, I, here's what I would say. 
you really want to find out the exact kind of plant you're working with. And then, do you have computers? Y if you find out the exact name, right, it can't just be ornamental sweet potatoes. You need to know the, if you can know the Latin name, because it might say it on a tag. Look it up, and you'll say right in the, um, right in the little bar, are such and such ornamental sweet potatoes edible? EDU. EDU is like the education, you're going to get an educational answer based on research. Okay? So type that in and see what it says. It'll say if it's not edible. You'll, it, a, a little link will, not a link, a site will come up and it'll say these are strictly for ornamental, they're not to be consumed or people have eaten them but they, they're not as flavorful or whatever. I mean, some of them are pretty, big. Pretty good size on that yeah. one. So, so when you go to the store and you're buying plants and you, they have those little um, information plastic things in there, yeah. save that, okay. right? Because that's got information on there that's going to help you Might have when you. Name yes, that. right. Uh, okay. Often it does. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Yes. When you were showing the mounding, they showed the one that was mounded. Yeah. Yeah. Can you split it? Just split it right down the middle? No. You're gonna like if this uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find it. Am I going the wrong way? Yes I am. You don't wanna split it down the middle because you don't wanna split this. Right? That's what, oh remember before I said I wanted to tell you something else about this screen? Very often when people are doing this they nick the stem and it will help stimulate growth okay so what where you're putting it you got to be real careful because you don't want to cut through okay you're just going to nick it a little bit all right mm -hmm. to help growth yeah can you use rooting powder or anything like that um you can i have i have not and i've had this work and the one right behind you um do New plants grow off above the roots? What's going to happen is this is going to continue to grow. This is going to grow up. Oh, okay. And you'll get a plant there, right? So that you're going to snip this here so that you have all these roots supporting this new plant. Gotcha. All right. Now, who just, Dave? Okay, so yeah, you don't want to split this. Okay, you're going to go, you're going to cut it right here so that there's these roots supporting this. You don't want to cut through this guy, okay? And then after you, what I would do is after you get these divisions off here that have grown roots, you can pull some of that away because it's just going to keep growing more roots and then those will have a chance to wrap around here and kill that. Would you have to pretty much take it away to begin with to see where the roots are when you're cutting? Before you do, before when it's time you think it's time to cut, oh, yeah. Right, so you can make a clean cut. Right. Yes. Okay, then just leave it away. Don't build it back up. Okay, makes sense, everyone. Who else has questions? Yep. I'm just going to say one other thing. If anybody wants to try uh, winter sowing, I have extra milk cartons and. Uh, Apple cider parts I'll bring out to you cool. the program in November with the um, soil and water con uh -huh. conservation. And they gave us really nice instructions that are in the seed library upstairs, which is the other thing I wanted to tell you if you want to get free seeds. Uh, we have a seed library right upstairs at Metro Library, mostly which we purchased from an heirloom organic place called Annie's Heirloom Seeds. Some are shared by your neighbors, and it'll say the difference on the seed packet, whether this was donated by somebody. Thank you. Nice. Or they're from Annie's. So I'm still building it back up. I've got a lot more seeds in my office to package up, but it's like a fourth full right now. But come back in another month, we'll even be more. But if you want to get started today, please take some. Thank seats. you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, like I have a problem with the ec ec echinacea. Like when I want to, like at the end of the season, get the seeds. Yep. I can hardly tell which is the seed and which is the part calf. of the pant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. What you're going to want to do is you cut your um, flower, yeah. right? So you can cut it close, but I would cut it longer. Let me see. Uh, there. So you cut it longer. 
So there's this, just pretend this is like one of your stems, right? Mm -hmm. And then you attach it up in the air over some white surface, right? And you leave it there. It needs to be really, really dry. So if it just drained, that's a problem. If it's a fresh dead flower, that's a problem. It needs to be really dry. The flowers, the seeds, will fall out. You can even, after it gets very dry, you can take the flower and just go like this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter if there's little bits and pieces of the flower in there. The seeds are fine mixed in there. Sometimes if you get a wild flower packet, you know, with all different kinds in there, it will say mix it in with some sand so that um, the seeds don't stick together, that they all get spread out, right? So it doesn't have to be pure, but that's one way so you can see how many seeds you're actually getting. Okay, you let it get very, very dry. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much. Happy spring, it's so close. Enjoy your plantings.